Friends, I'd like to start by wishing you a, a blessed and glorious and happy Easter and to uh, express my thanks to Chris and Christ the King Retreat House for helping us to have this time together. You know, I have to admit uh, with some shame that you know, as I became a Christian and later uh, became more of an adult in my faith, I went years not knowing that Easter was more than just a day. I, of course, that's a great day. And I thought Easter Sunday was incredible with everything we got to experience. But years later, I learned that Easter is, in fact, a season. Not unlike Lent, it's lengthy, it's seven weeks, and takes us right up to Pentecost. And it mirrors, in some respect, uh, some of the spirituality that we see in Lent. Where Lent has a spirituality that's based on repentance, about changing the direction of our lives, of making a way for the Lord through generosity and prayer and through fasting, the spirituality of Easter is unique in its own way. And uh, it's a journey that we're going to take together over the next seven weeks. And it'll prepare us for Pentecost. And if I could sum it up in a, in a simple word, where Lent is about repentance, the Easter season is about transformation. It's about being transformed by the love and the power and the presence of the risen Christ. And so each week we'll come together and we'll see how Jesus and, the, and his presence transforms us. Now, for this week, we go right back to the tomb and we go right back to that first encounter, the first herald of the resurrection, Mary Magdalene. And Mary, it tells us in the Gospel of John, just after uh, from that beautiful gospel reading where Peter and John are brought out to the tomb and they, they run back to the upper room, it says that Mary Magdalene stayed outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet of the body where Jesus had been. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? You know, it's a very interesting thing to consider that Easter Sunday begins with grief. If we could imagine the emotion of what Mary Magdalene and those women that were so close to Jesus uh, were going through, it, it would be shock and horror and grief and loss. I mean, they had been faithful to the end. They had seen Jesus tortured and crucified and, and dead, and they had buried him. It wasn't abstract to them. It wasn't something they had to imagine. It was visceral and real, and it must have been, in one sense, horrifying. And so here's Mary, so faithful to come out before dawn and to be at the tomb and to be confused and, and lost and, 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 and grieving. And friends, um, that's okay. It's okay. Notice what the angels and what Jesus begin with. It's the same question. Why are you weeping? And friends, I think that's a question at the start of our Easter journey and of our Easter spirituality that Jesus and the Holy Spirit would ask us right now. Why are we weeping? What is it that we've lost? What are we confused by? What is it that we're suffering through? And friends, quite honestly, in the midst of this uh, ordeal that we're all going through, everybody has lost something. And it's not up to us to gauge the drama or the scale of the loss. It may be that you've just been inconvenienced. It may be that you've lost the comfort of being with people. It may be that you've lost space in your house. It may be, though, more significant. It may be that you've lost money or a job or security. It may be that you've even lost a loved one. I know for so many of my good friends in New York City who are doing ministry, they're suffering incredible losses personally and in their churches and in their workplaces and their neighborhoods. And so there's loss. You know, you may be a person in high school or college who's lost a, a prom, or uh, you may have lost a sports season, or perhaps you've lost a graduation. None of these are insignificant, and they're, they're losses. And so the beauty of the Easter spirituality is that we don't just walk into Easter Sunday as if we didn't know about what happened Good Friday. You see, this is not just a feel-better scheme or a self-help thing or a, hey, attaboy, we'll turn it around. 
but it's deeper. It's more human. It's more real. We did go through Good Friday. We are going through Good Friday. And yet, Easter has now come. There is something on the other side of loss and grief and confusion. Now think about this from Jesus' perspective. You know, I don't know what you would do. I, you're probably a better person than I am. But had I gone through all of those things, Thursday night, the betrayal, the arrest, uh, in, uh, incarceration, and then the torture and, and the, the trials and the spitting and the mocking and then the crowd and the suffering and the crucifixion and all these different things. If I went through all of that and then on Sunday morning rose from the dead, I can tell you I'd, I'd be in one of two places. I'd either be that morning as, as Pilate came into his uh, office or his courtroom, I'd be sitting on his throne and saying good morning to him. But probably uh, in a more personal way, I would have preferred to be at Caiaphas's house. And I would have uh, been talking to him about his, uh, the way that he was running the temple. And I'd be telling him about a good tailor to go and take care of that curtain that had been split in two. But Jesus wasn't like that. Think about this for a second. Jesus did not go back to those who had killed him. But his first words as the resurrected Lord are to a woman whom he had done ministry with, who he was close to. And he doesn't talk about himself at all. Instead, he says, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Jesus is not surprised that he rose from the dead. We're going to see that over and over. He expected it. And so he comes with compassion, with empathy, with sympathy. And he walks right into this world of confusion and grief and loss, knowing fully who he is, knowing fully what he's done. And yet, he's so humble that he says to Mary Magdalene, echoing the angel, why are you weeping? Friends, Jesus starts our Easter spirituality by asking you that same question. What is it that you've lost? What is it in this season that you're uh, grieving? What is it that you're weeping about? And friends, it's okay. It's okay. Jesus gives us permission. In fact, he encourages us to name it. One of the first ways that we can begin to move forward in the Easter spirituality is to name the things that we've lost. And that's okay. Because we're going to find out that Jesus will walk alongside of us in that loss. And so take some time this week. Even if it's privately or as a family or maybe as a business or a working group or whatever it is, what have you lost? Name it. It's okay to do that. You know, I, I can remember vividly the emotions in the moment when I was standing on the phone with a physician who told me that I had a very serious cancer diagnosis. And things began, as I went and learned that information and learned more about it, I began to lose some things and I suppose I grieved them in some way, but it was important along the way to be realistic and to name the things that I was losing. But Jesus doesn't leave us there and he transforms that grief. Now listen uh, to what uh, Mary's response is. She thought that Jesus was the gardener and she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you laid him and I'll take him. Previously, she said, they have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And that's, I don't want to do too much of this to Mary, but I know for me, when I hear that for myself, I am always thinking about who the they are. I'm grieving, I lost something, and it's their fault. It's they who did something. Now, obviously, she's confused, and that's understandable. Nobody expected, realistically, that Jesus would raise from the dead. But I have to be careful, because myself, in my own life, I want to blame it on them. My losses are their fault, or it's them. And we're going to probably see, in the coming months, an instinct in our society to blame someone for all of this, whether it be our leaders our politicians, our employers, our family, you know, we're, we're going to look outside of ourselves for that which we've lost. And that's okay too, but it's not a good place to live. It's not a good place to stay. And Jesus just moves right through it. When she says to him, where have you put the body? Jesus just looks at her and this is the moment of transformation. It says, Jesus said to her, Mary. 
And it's in that moment that he speaks her name, that this all becomes incredibly personal. And Mary recognizes who Jesus is. Rabboni, she said in Hebrew, which means teacher. You see, Mary's grief, Mary's confusion, Mary's loss, it's all transformed by the simple recognition of Jesus in his presence and him articulating her name. In that moment, what Mary experiences is that not only is Jesus alive, but Jesus knows her. He knows her grief, he knows her loss, and he knows her name. And friends, that's true for all of us in Easter spirituality. And on this first week of Easter, Jesus knows your name. He knows your loss. He knows your pain. He knows your confusion. He's not going to skirt through those things or walk around them. He may even know whom you're blaming for things. But to be quite honest with you, friends, he's willing to to be with you in that loss, in that grief, in that confusion, and then bring himself into it and simply be with you. And friends, in being with Jesus, in the resurrected Jesus, things begin to change. You know, Easter spirituality is rich because it takes into consideration the the reality of Good Friday, the reality of humanity, but it changes things. And think about what we're experiencing here now, even I'm in the Northeast with the spring. Yes, there's this incredible pandemic happening globally, and yet the birds are coming out, and the flowers are rising up, and the grass is beginning to grow, and the winds and the rains are blowing through and washing the face of the earth. Life comes back. But it comes back after winter, and we just experienced that. Friends, What Jesus is teaching us here is that death is human. All of us are going to die. Suffering is human. It is a part of our life as much as we try to make our life comfortable and easy and and, and soft as possible. Suffering and death is human. And yet, on the other side of that is life again. That life comes from death. You know, Mary is so excited to be with Jesus in this moment of transportation that she grabs onto him and he tells her, don't hold on to me because I have more to do. But then he sends her back to the apostles and she runs back and says, I have seen the Lord and reported what we had, he had told her. Jesus gives Mary an important mission. He transforms that grief and confusion and loss into not only uh, an experience of his presence, but also uh, the proclamation of his gospel, of this good news. And so suddenly uh, a cemetery, a, a grave is changed into the seat of renewal, of hope, of joy, of exultation, because the grave is no longer the final word. The grave is a step to life and life eternal. And because Jesus, God made flesh, was man, he's taking all of us with him. And it doesn't mean that death isn't scary or that death isn't real or that losses and confusion don't happen, but it means that they don't have the final word. It means that they are a part of the process as we enjoy eternal life. St. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 8. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. For I am convinced, and listen here, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew! And that's what Easter spirituality is all about. It doesn't mean that there isn't life or there isn't death or there aren't angels or aren't demons or there isn't concerns about the future or there isn't heights or depths or other issues that we deal with. It just means that none of those can take away from us the presence of our living Lord. And with his presence, everything else begins to fade. The reality of life is this. We are going to die. But you know what? 
we're all going to live forever. And it's because of him. And when that begins to soak into us, our graves are transformed. Our cemeteries are changed. Yes, they are places of loss, but they are places of remembrance and they are places of great hope. We have an incredible future. Pope Francis preaching this morning from the Vatican said this, Jesus' resurrection tells us that death does not have the last word. Life does. Friends, that's the beginning of our journey in Easter spirituality. A transformation from the presence of Christ, the resurrected Christ. And friends, he's available to you today. I'd encourage you this week to name those things that you have lost. To take a moment and consider who it is that you're blaming for what it is that's confused you or you've lost. Just get it out in the open and get it known. Maybe share it with someone that you trust. But then most importantly, spend time thinking about the fact that Jesus knows you personally and by name, and he's with you right now. And he's offering his presence to you, not so that you don't experience hardship, but so that those losses and that confusion and that grief is changed by the power of his love, because nothing can separate you from him. And no matter what happens, no matter what losses we experience, we are all going to live forever.